Right. So, um, welcome everyone to Q and A with the Dean November session. We are very excited to have you here with us all. Uh, before we start, though, I want to make sure we can have a chance to introduce our panelists. So, Dean Wood, would you like to start? Hi, I'm Sharon Wood, Dean of the Copper School of Engineering, and this is my eighth year of serving as Dean. Awesome. And then, Chari? Hi, I'm Chari Prasad. I'm a freshman ECE, and I'm very excited to be um, asking questions for Dean Woods. Awesome. And then, Riva. Hi, I'm Riva. I'm a second year electrical and computer engineering major. Awesome. And then my name is Allison. I'm the director of engineering student life and I will be monitoring the chat. So um, a lot of you have submitted questions already before this. So thank you so much for those who've submitted. So Charu and Riva will take turns asking those questions. But if any of you have any questions that you like, would like to ask live, feel free to throw it in the Q&A. You can also put stuff in the chat, but we're going to um, mostly try and direct you to the Q&A, but I'll, I'll be monitoring both of those. So um, without further ado, we'll jump on into the questions. Great. Um, so, and, yeah. Char, you want to start? Yes, that would be great. Um, so there have been a lot of questions asked by engineering students about mental health, especially during COVID. So do you think the engineering school put a larger emphasis on mental health post-COVID, and how has COVID impacted available mental health resources within Cockrell? Dean Woods. So um, I think that, I think um, COVID has exacerbated for mental health issues for everyone. Mm -hmm. We're isolated. We don't have our the communities that we normally rely on, and I think it's it's been really hard. I was just just listening to something on the radio today that people who have been hospitalized with COVID two and three months later are still having serious mental health issues. So we have been working with the university. We'll have a second care counselor in the Cockrell School. Uh, I'm hopeful that person will start in January. So that will be someone who is um, embedded in the school, will be the, another first point of contact along with Jenny Wade or um, engineering students. So I think, I think it's really important. Um, the Student Engineering Council has their Cockrell Cares, which I think is a great program where we ha they highlight uh, mental health issues and try to encourage everyone to participate in the resources that are available. So this is something that is really important for us, yeah. For sure, I think that's a wonderful investment. And actually through Cockrell School Cares, they have an event going this week that people should get involved with. It's actually to talk about mental health and to get involved asynchronously and not through Zoom. So that should be a good time. That's, that's a very good idea. I think we're all zoomed out at the moment. Great, yeah. Uh, okay, Dean Wood, shifting away uh, for a second, um, talking about research at Cockrell, how would the reopening of undergraduate research look for the upcoming months if it were to be approved? So we are we're trying to work on that. I think, first off, um, the vice president for research controls our research labs. And so right now we are at a, I think it's called phase three. Um, which means that our the students work, the grad students working in the labs are working in cohorts and they have only specified times that they can be in the lab. So provided we remain at that level and um, that the university is allowing undergrads to be in the lab, then what we're gonna try to do is, is find a way to relax the requirements slightly for the spring semester. What we wanna be able to do is um, you know, there, there might be some students who maybe they were um, writing an honors thesis or something like that. We want to we want to see if we can find a way to give them the opportunity to collect the lab data they need to continue to complete their work. But until um, until all restrictions are removed, it will not be it won't be completely open like it's been in the past. We're still going to have to be very strict uh, have strict restrictions on who actually is in the lab at any time. Wonderful. Shifting the focus a little bit more to Zoom learning. Are there any workshops in place currently that help professors learn how to better use Zoom to teach slash teach professors how to make class more engaging for students? If not, what are the chances of doing so maybe over the break to possibly enhance the learning experience this semester? Yeah, so this summer um, we had a number of committees within the Cockrell School. And one of the things was um, best practices for online education. 
So they produced a whole series of recommendations. Unfortunately, it came out, um, you know, it, it took them a while to do their work. And so it came out kind of in August. So I'm not sure all faculty actually benefited from it. So people made the point of, make, of um, distributing that information again and encouraging faculty to look at it. I think the, the fact that the spring semester is going to be much like our fall semester, meaning that most of our classes will be online. And um, I think it's many faculty are receptive to learning from these best practices and not just trying to do everything on their own. Wonderful. Um, Dean, Dean Wood, you mentioned that campus in the spring will be looking a lot like it does currently in the fall. Um, speaking of campus, will any more engineering rooms be opened up for study purposes next semester? So I, I was surprised when I saw that question because I see very few students actually on campus right now. And so all of our um, uh, open spaces, you know, we've got we have tables out and we have study spaces and I haven't, I haven't even seen that opened up. So if the, if the need arises, we can, we can work toward that. But at least right now, um, our, our resources have not been utilized even to the limited capacity that are available. The university also has additional um, study spaces. So for example, you know, let's say you're, you're really worried about um, having internet access when you go for your final exams. You can stay at, at UT and do the, these uh, in university buildings. And um, they have additional, the library has facilities. I think um, Gregory Gym has space. And I think, I think it's Rex Sport also. And it's my understanding these have been really underutilized this semester too. So I, I happened to be on campus on Saturday afternoon. And I was really pleased to see just people walking around and again. The campus had been empty for so much of the semester. And so it, it had the feel of a, of a weekend in the middle of the summer when not many people were here other than the, a fall weekend. But it was just nice to be able to walk around and see people. So I'm, I'm you know, we, they've got, like Gregory Gym has all those picnic tables. They've got Wi-Fi there. So you can even be outside and, and doing stuff. But there are, there are indoor um, spaces that are available um, for anyone in the university. That's great. Yes, I definitely think that next semester there will be more people on campus, hopefully. So maybe there will be more of a normalcy. I um, hope so. Right. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk about the vaccine coming out. A lot of the companies have positive trials. So someone asked, if a COVID vaccine is created in the winter, how will that change their approach to spring 2021? Will we convert to, from online to in-person? I would like nothing more, but that's, that's not going to happen. Okay, so um, the first doses of the vaccine have been dedicated to uh, frontline healthcare workers. And, and um, it's my understanding that it will probably be um, May when vaccines will be available for faculty and staff on campus. You need to get two shots. There has to be two to three weeks between each shot, and then you have to wait another two to three weeks before the vaccine would be totally effective. So, um, and then we still have to, then students need vaccines, right? So what we're hoping is that we will be back in person um, for the fall semester, but you're right. I mean, I've heard two things now, the Pfizer is over 90% effective. The one that came out today was 94.5% effective. This is great news, um, but it's gonna take a lot longer to distribute that than, than that we really could have reliably have an impact on our spring semester. That's great. Thank you for all that information. I actually didn't know about like how many times you need to get a shot or all that stuff. So that's really good information. Yeah. I didn't um we did we get briefed by the dean of medical school about once a week and so that I didn't know all the details either but um I guess then going off that and like hoping to like return to normalcy somewhat um what can we do to have an in-person graduation and will Cockrell host any ceremonies in person for graduation in the spring? 
the university is planning to have in, um, in person ceremonies for the spring. And also, we will be inviting back students who graduated in who graduated in May of 2020, but we were not able to recognize. The shape of the, the um, actual format is not yet known. At one point, they were telling us that we, we might have the proper school commencement in the football stadium. Um, and if that were the case, then each student would probably be able to bring a few guests. But we also have been told, but we've also been told that, well, maybe we retain our indoor venues, and then it could be only the students get to participate in person, but they would have high quality live streaming. So I can't tell you what the format is going to be yet, but I can tell you that the university is moving forward with the planning for in-person commencement ceremonies. Kind of stemming off that for more information about the spring semester, would you happen to know if summer study abroad sessions were still going to happen or is it a little too early to say? So they're still planning on some study abroad. Um, I think um, I think the way it's set up right now, we have about until spring break to if you if you enroll in it and then things aren't better by spring break, we can cancel and not not lose um, a lot of money. So I think um, our international engineering education office is moving forward with trying to plan some of these. It is a much reduced um, planning effort than we've had in the past. Um, and just based on what I heard about vaccines, personally, I'm a little pessimistic about the opportunity, but they are, they are trying to do the planning right now. Wonderful. Yeah, I told you his, his tail would make it into the um, kind of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, how is UT planning to get high schoolers interested in applying and attending UT now that usual tours and welcome events are not possible? Yeah, they're they're doing um, the same type of um, virtual events. One of the things that we want to we want to start is we want to start working with the um, the vision for um, diversity and community engagement. They have some high schools in the um, in Houston, Dallas. They work with some in the Valley. So we want to do some specific outreach efforts um, from engineering for them. But everything has to has to be virtual right now. Yes. Shifting it a little bit back to COVID. So there's obviously been an uprise in COVID cases and numbers. So someone asked, how is Cockrell hand handling COVID safety? What protocols are in place for those who may wish to return to campus this spring after a virtual semester this fall? Well, most of our classes will remain virtual in the spring. So I think the I think the university has um, done a, a really good job of trying to navigate this, right? I think, but also I think students have voted with their feet. So we had a number we had a number of hybrid classes where students could come into the classroom if they wanted to, or they could participate remotely. Most students decided they were gonna participate remotely. So I anticipate that we will, that will be very much the same thing in, in the spring. Um, the only classes where it's required that you come in are some of our laboratory classes. And then what happens is a, a portion of a lab group will come in and do the experiment and everyone will analyze the data. So I anticipate that, again, will be very similar um, in the spring. Yes, I'm like one of the few who are trying to come to campus next spring, except I okay. do all online classes. <laughs> I think I just yeah. need to change the pace and I've actually, um, I've seen all my friends have not actually caught COVID this semester, which I'm very grateful about and they've been right. testing. So I'm excited to come. So I've heard that the dorms have capacity for the spring. Um, so that can be an option for students who are, are looking for a place to live. Um, yeah. Um, I guess still kind of staying on track with uh, COVID related questions. Um, with the standard resolution to have optional pass fail this for the fall semester 
and with the petition being signed by thousands of students, do you see the administration changing their minds and possibly reinstating the policy for the spring? So that's a good question. I have not actually seen the Senate resolution yet. I know um, students have asked me about this. The past two meetings I've had with students have asked me about this. I was a strong proponent for it last time because I thought that um, you know you have enough stress in your lives and trying to do do the tests, taking tests remotely, it just makes it even more stressful. Um, I know when I brought it up earlier in the semester before there was a Senate resolution. I was told the university had no plans to switch back to pass fail for the fall semester. So I, I recommend sign the petition, try to get, get the administration to, to look at it. Um, but I know when I brought it up earlier this semester, there was not a lot of support for it. Yes, ma'am. And kind of following up along that, has there been any discussion at a higher level about allowing students to queue drop a class after grades are posted like last spring? So that's a really good question, and I have not heard anything about that either. But I will I will take that one and, and pass it forward to the provost's office just to see. And it, you know, it could be that um, they could limit you to a certain number of classes. I, I, I don't know, but I will certainly take that forward. Wonderful. That would be very helpful. Um, I suppose keeping on track still about academics and COVID. Um, in regards to virtual proctoring, there are several students who lack stable connection and have expressed their concern as um, a lot of proctoring services, once you cut out with your internet, they don't let you back into the exam. Uh, some departments such as ECE have banned proctoring services for this reason. What are your thoughts on standardizing virtual learning environments in the Cockrell School? Um. Each faculty member really gets to make decisions for their own courses. And so I didn't know, for example, that ET has banned preferences. I know we've had trouble with them. And I know, for example, um, if you know if someone in your household were to walk behind you with the camera, that that would be enough to trigger something. So I know that we're not very happy with the proctoring services. When I mentioned that there was a um, committee within the Cockrell School that looked at best practices, they were recommending having a series of smaller quizzes distributed throughout the semester rather than having the big, the high stakes exam. And so that was the recommendation. But as I mentioned, each faculty member really, they have, they have the authority to oversee what's best for their individual course. And it's really not possible for me to mandate uh, changes. So I don't see any way that we can standardize this within the school. Um, plus, I think both of you mentioned you're in your first year. I would expect almost all your classes are actually outside the Cockrell School. They're in math and physics and you know natural sciences and some of the other departments. So what I can recommend is if you, well, you have the option of staying on campus and doing things on campus or if you are experiencing um, real problems contact the advisors in engineering student services because we do have some funds available and we might be able to for example allow you to increase your internet access at home for the month that you have exams going on right so you have a more stable internet access so Anyone who is have, who has concerns about their um, their internet connections, please reach out to ESS, talk to someone, and we have a specific fund to help students get through these challenges. That's actually really important that you highlighted that. Thank you. So, shifting it more back to mental health. Um, do you think it's important for all professors to provide time banks or assignment extensions at the beginning of the semester to give some leniency to students who may have had a stressful week, needed a mental break, or unplanned personal circumstance, especially during COVID times? I would like to think that faculty are flexible, but I know that when you're teaching a really large class, it's it's hard to stay on top of everything because you've got to keep the great, you know, you give assignments, you want to make sure everyone is staying on top of the material. Um, and so it's a really, it's a challenge. 
So I think we can recommend these as best practices. But as I mentioned, I, each faculty member has, has the ability to teach the way they think is best. And so I can make recommendations, but that is all I can do. Yes, ma'am. A, um, a couple of my professors have actually done that. And I realized like if you have a problem and they haven't assigned that, you can always email them. But it's nice to already have the option in the beginning. So I right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, OK, I can go ahead and ask the next question. Um, is the administration able to recommend to professors not to assign midterms or quizzes on weeks that may be especially stressful for students? Uh, for example, election week, um, I believe a lot of students had several midterms and projects due that week, which was already a pretty high stress week to begin with. Yeah, I think election week is probably um, the, the example, and I think you're right, it is a high stress week. I mean, I, I'll be, I'll, I remember when I came here and I, I was teaching for my first time and the student said to me, well, you can't give a test on this day because it's the, the day after the OU, two days after we play OU in football. And I'm thinking, well, I taught at Illinois for 10 years and no one told me that I couldn't schedule a test based on the football schedule. So I went to my colleagues and I said, what is this? And they go, oh yeah, you can't schedule a test on this OU weekend. It's like, oh. Okay, I can't stand your test. Um, so, I mean, we can make recommendations, but the trouble is um, you each are taking five or six classes. There are different faculty, there are different schools and colleges, and they, we don't, there's no way that we can coordinate when all the tests are. So, a, a week becomes incredibly stressful because you have three midterms in it. And then let's say, you know, um, something else happens, your car breaks down, but that there's no way to coordinate all that. So, um, you know, for final exams, if you do have, I think it's three in a 24 hour period, you can talk to faculty members and request that you, you move once that you have a little more flexibility. So that's, that is a university um, policy and that's something I recommend you consider around exams if, it, if it's, um, really a cause of stress for you. But I, I know that my, you know, my car breaks or my dishwasher breaks always when I, in the time of high stress, it's just Murphy's Law. So. Mm -hmm. Kind of shifting the focus more to the future. What do you see as the main priorities for Cockrell School in the immediate future, next spring and fall semester? So I think, um, as I mentioned, I think next spring we're just hanging on. And so I think we need to try to do the best we can to help our students and get the most out of this virtual environment. I am really hopeful that we can be back in person next fall. And so I think next fall we have to focus on community building because we'll have two groups of students who are essentially new to campus, right? We'll have the, the first year students and also the second year students. So I think we're going to need to focus on community building, getting students engaged in, in um, different types of um, engineering organizations, and really trying to work on that community. I guess falling in line again with looking towards the future, um, can you give us any updates on the CPE and when will the renovations be done? Yeah, I, I wish I knew when the renovations would be done. They should have been done over a year ago. So I can't answer that, but I can tell you what's going on. Um, the, the CPE building um, was built in the mid 1980s. And this was a time when there was a ton of construction on campus, but I think they were also building, they, they were building for the immediate use of the building and they weren't considering long-term use. So we've added a lot of fume hoods to that building and the HVAC system just couldn't keep up with it. So what's happening is they're putting new air handling units on the on the roof and then they've got the distribution ducts are those large circular ducts that are coming down the side and are getting tied into each floor. 
So basically, um, the systems that are on each floor are um, they're worn out, and we're providing alternatives. And the hope is that this will allow us to continue to use the building for another, um, they said three to five years, it probably will be a little longer than that until we can do a full renovation of the building. So um, their environmental health and safety has been in the building. We have actually, it's not, we don't have safety issues, but because the equipment is wearing out, we needed to do this renovation to, per, to allow us to continue to use the building. Because if we had a, a failure of an HVAC system, there would be no easy way to replace it. We'd have to shut down part of the building. So this allows us to keep using the building. I am, I, I joked with you about when it was supposed to be done. It was supposed to be done um, fall of 2019, but that's, um, but I'm hopeful that by, by spring of 2021, by the beginning of the semester, um, that we should be, everything should be back up and running. Thank you for the update. Along the same lines, someone asks, is there an appetite to renovate or retrofit PMA? It would be nice to make it mirror the appearance and amenities of ECJ or EC, oh gosh, <laughs> ECJ or EER. So PMA, Luckily, is not an engineering building. <laughs> so um, they they also have um, PMA. I think was built around the same time, and the university had a list of of four buildings that were the highest priority for renovations. And number one was CPE. Uh, PMA and Patterson were on the list, and I don't remember the relative order. And then the Harry Ransom Center. Um, those were the four buildings that were the highest priority for the university. It's, it's very hard to build in. So, you know, one of the great things about the e, about EER is the large atrium and all the student interactive spaces. It's really hard to add that after the fact because there's no structural system to support it. And you can't like cut columns in in the structure because the whole rest of the building will fall down, right? So I, I don't, in, I think with just given the structure of PMA, it's been really hard to have large open spaces. However, it is on one of the lists for, for priority um, renovation for the university. Um, I know that they're, have, they are not able to do uh, some of the experiments they need to do in the physics department, for example, because of the facility. Sounds good. Um, I guess continuing on the buildings theme, uh, speaking of an engineering building, uh, when will the energy building be available for student use? Yes, so the Gary L. Thomas Energy Engineering Building is scheduled to be completed this summer. And we are hopeful that all the facade will be up before the end of this calendar year, so it will be dried in. And then they can work on the interior of, um, finishes um, during the spring semester. And so we are hopeful that that building will be open for the, um, for the fall semester. Now, if you, neither of you was around, but Allison was around when we opened the EERC. And we were so excited to open it, we opened it while it was still a construction zone. And that was not the best decision we ever made. So we've made the decision that we will wait to open the building until it is actually totally complete. So if the construction gets delayed for some reason, our, our opening will be delayed and we'll, we'll move in when we, as soon as we can. But right now it looks as if we'll be able to move in for the, um, for the fall 2021 semester. Shifting the topics back to virtual learning environment. Someone asked, due to the pandemic, we have become more comfortable learning online. Do you think some classes will continue to be offered online slash hybrid even after everything goes back to normal? I think we're going to retain some aspects of the, um, the environment we're in. I, so for example, what I've heard from a lot of students is they like the ability to go back and rewatch portions of a lecture. So if, for example, a faculty member is going over a problem in class or talking about a theorem, 
and you just don't catch it the first time, being able to rewatch it and, and you know, just listen to it a couple times to figure out what they're saying, um, that's been very positive. And so I, from that standpoint, I think that this kind of the decision to, to record lectures and make them available to students, I think that will probably continue. I think the other thing that's been really positive is we can now have um, ex visitors come into class and talk to you for 10 or 15 minutes, give you some neat ideas, help you see how what you're learning is going to apply to what you do in your career. But then you can go back to your lecture. Right, where in the past you might have to fly someone in, then they're here on campus a whole day, then they take another day flying home, and it's very disruptive. So we're not as it's not as easy to have that information come into the um, into the classroom. So I anticipate that that we will try to continue to have virtual guests and alumni. I think that will continue to be part of our environment. Um, I know that you know we've had to go to virtual laboratories. And we definitely don't want to continue that. I think our capstone design classes have been um, hampered because we don't have the students working together and building things together. So there are some things that we're, we're kind of muddling through right now because we have to, but we really want to get back to doing it in person. Yes, actually, I'm in a UGS class called SARS and Mystics, and so we learn about Russia. And so okay. we have weekly field trips. And so I've seen all of St. Petersburg and Moscow and so many museums and all these authors calling in from London. And it's actually been really amazing. And good oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Is that one of the small classes or the 300 person classes? It's only has around 50 people. So. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I guess kind of shifting gears back to uh, advising, I guess, new topic. Um, sometimes it feels like the advising teams are short staffed. Can we look into increasing academic advisors for each department during busy periods? So that's a good question. Um, I have submitted a proposal. I submitted a proposal to the provost office a couple of years ago, basically talking about this. We've had an increase in uh, the size of the undergraduate student body, but we have not had additional recurring funds. And it's not only in the advising office, I think we see it in um, the laboratories, right, because we're trying to have more people take each of the labs. With the financial situation right now, we're, I, uh, we have a hiring freeze, so there's no way that I can hire. And we're looking at budget cuts for next year. So I think these are all things that we, as we begin to move out of this financial crisis, we'll have the opportunity to start thinking about that. But that certainly is something on our list, yes. Shifting the topic a little bit to tuition. So someone asked, Dean Wood, Cockrell School students received approximately an additional 10% increase to tuition on top of the school-wide increase of 2.6% in the 20 to 21 school year. To what extent did the Dean's office contribute to this tuition increase and how will current engineering students benefit from this increase? So we were, in, I, um, both McCombs and the McCombs School of Business and the Cockle School of Engineering, the students uh, received ten, these 10% 10 differential tuition increases. The Dean's offices were not consulted as part of this. So this was a decision that was made at the highest levels of the university. And right now, um, I, let, let me, we, we talked about the ERC and we see it in Allison's slides. The university made a huge, huge commitment to us to build that building. They, they committed um, over $100 million to build that. And so when students ask me, where, are, where is this tuition money going? Well, in some respects, it's helping to pay back some of the money that the university gave us to, to build that incredible facility. So the other thing I can point to is, you know, we now are having a youth care counselor. Um, so we're increasing our services for mental health for the students. So basically, tuition comes into the university and it's retained at the, um, at the highest level. It does not follow the students. So I wish there was more I could tell you. 
but I can tell you that the EERC has totally transformed the Cochrane School of Engineering. And I am eternally grateful that President Powers, who was president at the time, made that commitment to engineering. And so being able to pay a portion of that back, I think it, it's everyone's benefit from it. Thank you for that information. Um, I guess still along the lines, I guess, of um, like financial discussion, any plans for increased financial aid or scholarships um, given economic hardships caused by COVID-19? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we have a, we started a, an emergency fund for students, specifically in engineering. So if any student has a financial, has an economic hardship because of COVID, facing food insecurity, facing housing insecurity, please talk with the advisors in ESS and they will try to find ways to, to help address those, those um, help you with financial aid. So the, the school has, has uh, recognizes that this is a very challenging time for everyone and it, it um, we're trying to do what we can and our alumni have been extremely generous in helping to support this effort. Shifting the topic a little bit more to your own personal experience, um, how have you pushed for creating a more balanced environment for women in engineering? Have there been many conversations about hiring more female professors slash faculties and how well do you think UT has been doing to combat this issue? Right, so um, having gender equity in engineering is something that's been discussed for, for decades. Um, when, when I was an undergraduate student, I think I had one course that was taught by a female faculty member. And, and the university that I attended actually had a policy that you could, the husband and wife could not both be, have tenured positions on the faculty at the same time. And I have no idea why that's the case, right? Um, so I think the fact now that about 20, more than 20% of our faculty are women is a tremendous change. Um, but what I've also realized is students are only on campus for four years and they want to be able to see noticeable change during that time. These changes take much more time. There, it's just um, the, the pace of an academic change is much slower than the students really want to see. So for example, things that have happened are um, when we're interviewing assistant professors, we have a requirement that um, you have to interview, interview at least three, three candidates, well-qualified ca candidates, and at least one has to be a woman or from an underrepresented um, ethnic group. So over the past few years, about 30 to 35% of the assistant professors we've hired have been women as a result of this policy. And this policy has been in place, my, my predecessor started it, so it's probably been about 15 years. But when you start with really small numbers, it just takes a long time for that to happen. And um, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Women in Engineering program. That will be next year. Um, I think they've done a great job in making sure that women feel as if they have communities within the Cochrane School of Engineering. Um, we are, we really are trying to try to increase the um, ethnicity of our, um, of our faculty, but it, it's a very long process. And I like to think that the fact that the university, for example, has, um, has changed policies and allows um, allows women to, to have, actually allows any faculty member to take, get course relief if they, for the birth or adoption of a child, right? We have a lot more family-friendly policies that were in place when I started. So it, it's been a slow progress, but we've, we've actually been making quite steady progress. Um, I, don't I don't know off the top of my head where we are relative to our peers with respect to female professors, but I can tell you that um, 
more than 25% of the bachelor's degrees awarded in engineering last year went to women. And amongst our peers, that puts us in really good company. I think that the top schools have between 20 to 30% of their degrees offered to women, so we're right in that category. So it doesn't mean we can stop, right? We're not, change, we're not relaxing any of these requirements. It's something that we look at all the time, um, but we, we are, we're, we are we're hiring the best faculty and we're hiring women into those, those situations. So it's a, it's a really good situation to be in. For sure, being a new student, um, Women in Engineering program actually has helped me a lot and it was really great to have that already there for me. And especially yeah. with the seven department we see has also been really helpful. And I actually have a female professor this semester, Dr. Nina Tulang, and I think it's just really good to have a right. role model to kind of look forward to. Right. So and the exciting. new department chair in ECE, uh, Deanna Markovetsky, is willing to serve in that role. Um, department chair of, of um, of biomedical engineering is a woman, Shelly uh, Sakiyama Elbert, and the new, um, starting in January, the new department chair in chemical engineering is a woman, Celia Milliner. So three out of seven of our departments will have women as leaders. So it, um, I mean, I, I started as a department chair in 12 years ago, in 2008, and I was the first woman to serve in that role. So to go from having the first ever to having three simultaneously, is a really big change. But the trouble is it's over three generations of students, right? So it seems really slow to the students who are here. For sure, but it's a lot more helpful than I think I expected it. I needed it to be in my like own education. So I'm right. proud of that. Yeah. Um, I guess, Dean Wood, you just mentioned that it takes a long time for change to happen. Um, and often it seems like it's not going as quickly. What are some of the biggest um Oh my bad. Uh, from the Q and A, what is the toughest challenge you face when trying to make Cockrell a more inclusive place for everyone? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I think I think so. I think what I found most discouraging is when I hear women students talk about how some of the um, some of the men treat them and how how um, you know, they, they feel like they're not viewed equally. So I, I feel as if we've, we've, the faculty has, has changed considerably. We've had a lot of success with the faculty, but having women still feel as if they're not treated equally by their peers, that, that really bothers me. And that's probably the hardest thing for me. And I, I find it interesting because I didn't really experience that when I was an undergrad. And that was a long time ago. So there weren't, there weren't, we didn't have the female role models in, in faculty. But I felt, um, I, you know, I, I read it in like enough, these surveys, the climate surveys that we send out. And I think that's been the hardest thing for me is um, I really want everyone, I've been working very hard to build an inclusive community within the Taco School. And I think we have, you know, people like Allison and all the staff in, in ESS and EOE and the um, WEF, that's what they're aiming for. And so to find that some of these just, um, some of these stereotypes are still lingering is, is really troublesome. Negative stereotypes. I'm kind of shifting the topic a little bit. So what is one area of improvement you would like to work on for the Cockrell School of Engineering? So, I mean, we've been, we've been talking about it. I think one thing that's really important is to really improve the community aspects and make sure that everyone feels as if they're part of our community. Um, we've been having a lot of training for faculty and staff over um, since since the George, um, George Floyd was murdered. And I think um, we, we want to focus on trying to increase the diversity within the school because we know that the solutions that you students develop, are, are we, they need to be as diverse as possible. We have to come up with solutions for the all of society. And if it's only one portion of society that's designing these solutions, then it's not gonna accommodate everyone and meet everyone's needs. So I think that's probably, if I could snap my fingers, 
that would be the area where I'd like to do it. Agreed. I think that's also like a global issue right now that we all need to address and right. we can bring change. And I think, um, I think one of the things that, that I've, um, I've concluded is how important allyship is. So if, if someone says something to you, it's really hard to, to defend yourself and feel good about it. But if someone says it to your friend, defending your friend and saying, wait a minute, that isn't right. Why, why are you saying that? Letting them know that they have someone supporting them and that, you know, that type of aggression we're not willing to tolerate within our community. I think that's really important. And that's something all of us can do is look at, look at things from other people's perspectives. And, you know, and, and if you say something stupid, just, oh, I am so sorry I said that. Because all of us say stupid things sometimes. And we don't mean it, but don't let it just hang there. Apologize, right? So I think that's that's something that we all have to work on, and it would really improve the community within the school. I think. Agreed. I think that's one of the best things to take away from this Q and A. Make sure to like be more educated and not be ignorant about things that could hurt possibly your friends or your fellow peers. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Dean. But that was um, uh, enjoyed that response. But uh, moving on to, I guess, you, um, turning the focus on to you a little bit, um, how have you been able to cope with staying in your home office more versus being on campus at UT? What are some tips you have for students that are struggling to keep up with their coursework because so much of it is online? Yeah, someone asked me this um, the other day. So I, if, if you're on at the beginning of the call, you know my cats like to participate actively in my Zoom sessions. And I can be honest, that's really hard. Um, I'll be having a meeting with my boss, for example, and they'll find a way to stand on the mute button and suddenly I'm muted and you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> but um, I, I find it hard to be isolated. I always thought that, you know, I, I am an introvert and I know that, but I'm finding it hard now because I am alone so much. So I'm, right now I'm coming to campus maybe two days a week. I don't get the social engagement that I normally have there, but it still is nice to be in a, in a slightly different environment. Um, with respect to being Zoom fatigue, um, I'm facing this also. I, I, I actually like, um, like the meeting right before this was the leadership team for the Coughlin School. And so it's, um, it's eight of us. I, we have an incredible team and I actually find Zoom works pretty well with that. So I try to take advantage of that. Um, and that's how I interact with people. But when it's in a bigger meeting or I don't know the people, that's when it's so hard to stay engaged. So I was telling someone recently that um, I, I start sending snarky texts on my phone to a friend. If, if we're in the same meeting and it's really boring, it's like, oh, this is boring, I'm dying. That help, that honestly just helps me have that little bit of engagement. So um, I was on an all day meeting for a professional organization a couple weeks ago. And my best friend is up in Minnesota. So we were texting a little. And then um, they were doing a, they said she hadn't voted on something and I noticed. And she said later that she had fallen completely asleep. She started snoring. <laughs> and luckily her husband woke her up and she was on mute. It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> so the good thing is most of it is recorded. You can catch it, you know, if it's, it's in class. I was known to fall asleep in class quite a bit. Um, you can catch what you missed. But I, I think really just trying to maintain that those personal friendships and whether it's, um, you know, someone you just met as part of your fig, uh, someone you've had a really strong relationship with and you, that, that's what we need now. We, we need community. And we're physically isolated, but I think we have technology, we have, we have texting, and um, so we have to make do the best we can with Zoom and then find other ways to engage our friends. That's actually really funny to hear that you're experiencing the same exact things that students are, and I'm sure that they're relating to that a lot right now. <laughs> yeah, the hardest thing is I'm at a meeting and I'm just bored to tears, my eyes are closing. It's like, oh, I'll stay awake. <laughs> I just saw something in the chat about Girl Day. Let me answer that. Uh, Girl Day will be virtual this year. 
And uh, WEP is, I, I don't know all the details, WEP is doing that. Um, we made a commitment to the NISB student chapter that we would hold a, um, a Black Youth Day. And we are going to do, we decided we would not attempt to do the first Black Youth Day in, um, virtually. We will wait till we can do it in person. That was great to hear. So someone asked another question regarding your life in particular. What's one thing about becoming Dean that has most surprised you? And are there any unique responsibilities slash duties that you weren't particularly expecting but turned out to like? Yeah, but so I think um, the duties that I wasn't, the duties I knew about but I turned out to like is probably trying to do fundraising um, because I have to, a decent portion of the time is trying to talk with prospective donors and encourage them to contribute to the Cockle School. And so I, I really didn't think I'd like that, but I, I do, because I really, I like being able to um, do things that will benefit the entire Cockle School and not just my research group or a few people. So that, I, I do like that. I think the thing that surprised me, most surprised me, um, I guess it is really how different the different departments are. I was, I was in um, civil architectural and environmental engineering, and I had been there at, at Illinois and also, uh, or at Illinois with civil and environmental, but anyway, Illinois and here at Texas, and so I had a really good feel for what this department was like. I visited a lot of other schools, and then I was just surprised at how different the cultures are in our, in our seven departments, and things that I thought everyone did, no, that's not the case, they're not done in other departments. So I, I think it just goes to some, you know, different engineering disciplines attract different types of people and they get together and they develop their own rules. And it's, I, it's fascinating to see how, how from the university perspective, engineering is homogenous, but then when you get here, it actually, there's so much, there's so many differences among the different areas of research and the way that things are done. So that, that is probably what surprised me the most. All right, to jump in, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, one last question. Um, Dean Wood, what are some of your hopes for the future? Well, number one, that we get through the COVID pandemic as soon as possible. Um, number two, that we can really focus on, um, focus on some of our priorities for education. We, when we built the EERC, we wanted to have a place where students could engage. And the National Instrument Student Project Center is specifically so that students can build things and work together. And it's, it's still open, but it's, it's really hard to do that with the COVID um, situation. So I think getting back to, um, it'll be a new normal, but getting back to having more engagement is gonna be, that's. Those are the things that I'm really hoping for in the very near future. All right. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time out of your days to answer these questions. Dean Wood, thank you, as always, for your candid responses. Um, Charo and Riva, thank you so much as well for representing all of our student body and asking the questions that have been submitted. Um, with that, we will wrap up. Any last words from you all before we, we shut down? Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. And be safe. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dean Wood, for taking the time to answer our questions. We really appreciate it. Yes. Absolutely. It was very nice to meet both of you. Me too. All right. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.